Good morning, saints, and welcome to worship. I'm here in our beautiful sanctuary at the First Congregational Church of Kalamazoo, Michigan. We're a member church in the United Church of Christ, and every Sunday we affirm that no matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today I'm in this space that is empty as you can see, but it is filled with a spirit of joy. We are learning more and more every day about how we can be part of one another's lives while still keeping this very special space central to all of us. I'm excited that in the next few weeks we're going to begin talking about some small events that we're going to be able to hold together safely, but I want to assure you that at every step of the journey, we are not going to do anything that places the most vulnerable members of our congregation or our staff at risk. We believe that by doing this, we're fulfilling Christ's vision, that whatever we do to and for the least of these, we are doing for him. So if you're new to us, uh, my name is Nathan Dannison. I'm one of the pastors of this church. I'll be giving the sermon today. But I hope that you can take a moment now just to catch your breath and allow the peace of God to be with you and to be in you and to be a part of this experience that we're about to have together. And so regardless of where you are and what's going on, go ahead and say aloud, peace be with you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pentecost. As you join us in the call to worship, please feel free to speak in your native language or another language that you know. Listen, can you hear the wind? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Look, do you see the dancing flames? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Can you hear the message in a language you understand? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Do you see the visions? Can you dream the dreams? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, let Pentecost become real in our lives this morning. Come and worship our God, who sends the Spirit to touch us and transform us into Pentecost people.
Brothers and sisters, at this time I invite you to join me in our prayer of sanctuary that we pray each week together. Let us pray. God, eternal refuge, we humbly ask that you protect your precious daughter, Sahida Nadim, in her time of struggle. Protect her from those who seek to do her harm. Give her strength and courage during the day and rest and peace during the night. Strengthen the spirit of all your children in the community of Kalamazoo. Make them one people for the sake of the poor, the wanderer, the immigrant, and all those seeking refuge in this difficult day. Amen. Sunday. This is a message for the kids. Today is a day in the church year that we call Pentecost, and it's the church's birthday. Our kids' church story for the whole month of June is going to be the story of what happened on Pentecost. So you can learn all about it in that story, but you'll also get to hear about it in the scripture that we're about to hear read in worship. Pentecost is a day when amazing things happened. There was a loud wind, there were tongues of fire, and people started speaking languages that they had never learned. It's a day all about how God bridges our differences to make one community in the church. So that's our blessing for today. You ready? Holy Spirit, speak to us and speak through us to make one community. Amen. Have a good week, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Good morning. I'm Barbara Graham Palmer. And on this morning of Pentecost, I will be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. I'm reading from the Inclusive Bible, so it may be different than the version that you're looking at. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they all met in one room. Suddenly, they heard what sounded like a fierce, rushing wind from the heavens. The noise filled the entire house in which they were sitting. Something appeared to them that seemed like tongues of fire, separating and coming to rest on the head of each one. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as she enabled to them. Now there were devout people living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, they all assembled. But they were bewildered to hear their native tongues being spoken. They were amazed and astonished. Surely all of these people are speaking our Galileans. How does it happen that each of us hears these words in our native tongue? We are Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, and Phrygia, and Familia, and Egypt, and other parts of Libya around Serene, as well as visitors from Rome. All Jews are converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs too. We hear them preaching, each in their own language, about the marvels of God. All were amazed and disturbed, asking each other, what does this mean? But others mocked them and said they've drunk too much new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and addressed the crowd. People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, listen to what I have to say. These people are not drunk as you think. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, it's what Joel the prophet spoke of. Listen. In the days to come, it is our God who speaks. I will pour out my spirit on all humankind. Your daughters and sons will prophesy. Your young people will see visions, and your elders will dream dreams. Even the most insignificant of my people 
I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. And I will display wonders in the heavens and signs on the earth. And the sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon will show deep red before the coming of the great and sublime day of our God. And all who call upon our, uh, the name of our God will be liberated. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Kindred, please pray with me. Almighty God, Creator, Redeemer, open the doors of heaven and pour forth a furious wind. Silence us and teach us how to speak again. Amen. There was a holiday once. This was an occasion when people who spoke different languages and they ate different kinds of food and followed different traditions gathered all together into one common place to celebrate this holiday. They ate with their families. They shared bread and wine with the neighbors who had traveled with them. They studied their neighbors, those who were different. Some of them looked on at their neighbors' little gatherings with curiosity, some with envy, and some with suspicion. But by needs, they gathered at this one place, regardless, because it was the only place that they had. Now, they'd learned over generations to share the space with people who were different from them. Maybe they kept their children close to them. Perhaps the more gentle-hearted amongst them shared with these strange neighbors a little food or offered a mute smile and an open hand. But in any case, as they ate in each other's company, the cacophony in the room would grow. It was an unrefined and dissonant chorus of languages, but they'd grown used to it over the years. But gradually, as time passed and years passed, the divisions between the groups gathered for this holiday began to grow deeper. People who were suspicious of particular groups sat as far away from one another as they could. And those with money, well, they would use their money to, uh, to keep others away from their tables. Now, everyone could see that this wasn't going to work. Eventually the room would fill, and eventually something would snap. And so those with the means to do so continued to push the poorest of the strangers into smaller and smaller corners. And then something did happen. Something awful. Something that everyone could see coming, but that no one had the courage to address from their seats and positions of power. Despite the fact that this place was a shared space, despite the fact that their holiday was the same holiday, and despite the fact that they all knew better, violence erupted somewhere in that room. And the noise seemed to come from above and from everywhere all at once. And fires broke out. And yet, suddenly, the anger in the stranger's face became comprehensible. It was the same anger, the same fear, and the same frustration. And someone shouted out, why can't we fix this broken system? And why? The question of why in so many different languages became the overwhelming cry of the suffering. And in what seemed like an instant, they all began to understand. And they began to comprehend that the suffering they were enduring was both self-inflicted and was a result of those who had power refusing to take responsibility for the welfare of those who did not have power. And it was the Holy Spirit that began to shatter that very specific illusion. And this was the illusion, the cobwebs, the haze that 
that the spirit began to clear away from their eyes. The illusion was that they were Parthians and Elamites, that they were Romans, that they were Asians and Arabs, that they were these things first. That illusion was suddenly shattered and they knew instead, they knew deep in their bodies and with holy comprehension that they were human beings first and that they were children of God first. And suddenly, in that place, in that moment, someone began to laugh, and another, and tears began to roll down their faces as this epiphany spread from person to person to person. The riot changed from violence to laughter. How blind they'd been. How foolish and selfish, pointlessly selfish. My God, look at all of the food. Look at all of the space and the joy that they could have. Gathered together, not under the illusion that they were Americans and Mexicans and Chinese and Nigerian. No, but that they were something simpler. Human creatures, children of God, living icons of a living God. And there was then finally a sweet, sweet Spirit in that place, and they knew that it was the Spirit of God. And their joy from then spilled out and over into the streets. But then, out there in the streets, there were others. They mocked them. They said that these people are drunk. They said that these people are naive. And they said these people have no common sense. And one of them, one of that crowd of dancing, celebrating, beautiful human beings, a man named Peter, stood up and he addressed all of the cynics and the mockers. And he said, no. What you're seeing is the world to come. It's God's vision for the world. And we are now the world builders. We are the image bearers. And we are the liberators. And we will win. And now, after 2,000 years, Years have passed. It still feels as though we've yet to come close, even, to winning. And today, those mockers and cynics in the street use different words. They use words like human nature and cultural depravity. And they use words like self-discipline, lack of responsibility. They use words like contributors, and liabilities. You see, some of them love the distance between us, these barriers between us that are enforced by wealth and violence in service to the lie. And as we have now this week surpassed the unimaginable horror of 100,000 dead Americans... From the coronavirus, I see these same people saying of the dead, well, they were predominantly elderly and sick anyway. They weren't contributing to the economy. And I saw White House advisor Kevin Hassett referring to the people who grow our food and build our cities as human capital stock. You see, these barriers they've put up, the ones that they've invented, they're important to them. Because for some of them, these barriers, these made-up identities, allow them to do something very, very profitable. It allows them to turn a human being into a commodity. The United States of America, its formidable wealth and infrastructure, was built by slaves. This is an indisputable fact, 
And slavery has taken on many different forms throughout our history, but one of the most pernicious was the chattel slavery of the American South. Wealthy white land owners had discovered a way to force some Americans to work without pay. And not only work without pay, but also contribute without pay of their minds, of everything that they had. They found a way to extract from these people wisdom and industry and art and music and poetry and child care and every other thing which people need to survive. They'd found a way to get all of these things for free. And they did it by arbitrarily declaring that some Americans were not human beings. So by doing this, they attempted to turn them into livestock, oxen, sheep, private property, commodities. But the problem was that they knew, whether explicitly or implicitly, that this was a lie, that race was something that they had invented to justify this system. A powerful lie upon which their massive, unearned fortunes depended. And they knew that it was not in the nature of a human being to be made into property, into chattel. And so they created, to defend this lie, one of the earliest systems of policing in American history the slave patrols. The owners of these enslaved people lived in constant fear that they would revolt and take what they had built, that which was by all rights theirs. The homes they had built for free, the crops they had harvested without pay, and that they would take back their children that had been stolen from them. Hundreds of years of white people looting the storehouses of black Americans, they would demand what was theirs. And so the slave patrols were created by the government with exactly one purpose, to control by any means necessary the freedom of these enslaved people. The slave patrollers wore badges on their chest. And they took an oath, following oath, actually. They said, I do swear that I will, as searcher for guns, swords, and other weapons among the slaves in my district, faithfully and as diligently as I can, discharge the trust reposed in me as the law directs to the best of my power, so help me God. That was the slave patroller's oath in North Carolina, 1828. These were not private mercenaries. Rather, they were agents of the state. They were paid by the government to do this. And a huge part of their job, really what occupied most of their time, was stopping and questioning black Americans about where they were going, where they were coming from, checking their papers, and if any suspicion arose meeting out physical punishment. As historian uh, Sally Hayden writes in her important work in the history of slave patrols in America, she writes, quote, The history of police work in the South grows out of this early fascination by white patrollers with what African Americans were doing. Most law enforcement was, by definition, white patrolmen watching, catching, or beating black slaves, end quote. And so what of the North, then? What of the North and their police history? Indeed, there was a history there, and there were police, and they served a very similar function. In the early 1800s, centralized municipal police forces were created in northern cities, but they didn't serve to prevent crime, or even solve crimes. They were there to control the people of the city. These first northern police forces were overwhelmingly white 
male, and more focused on responding to disorder than crime. As Eastern Kentucky University criminologist Gary Potter explains, officers were expected to control a dangerous underclass that included African Americans, immigrants, and the poor. And through the early 20th century, there were very few standards for hiring or training any of these officers. So we find that the history of those mockers, those standard bearers for division, included using the power of state violence to oppress, brutalize, and murder the poorest people, the very working people who built this nation. And last week, a very wealthy white person who was breaking the law in Central Park in New York, when she was called out by another New Yorker who happened to be a black man, she did what the wealthy white have done for centuries. She called for a slave patrol. And she knew exactly what she was doing when she did it. Do you remember what I said about those wealthy gathered in that room at the time of Pentecost? What links they would go to to maintain their position in the hierarchy of wealth that they had created? Now you and I know, of course, Christian, that in the kingdom of God, this hierarchy doesn't exist. Jesus declares it so when he explains why it is so incredibly difficult for the wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God. Because they're afraid of what life would look like if they lost even a fraction of what they had. Now the truly tragic thing is that for those of us who have felt the wind of Pentecost, who have learned how to speak in tongues, for those of us who have experienced the world that Peter is describing, we know that it is a better world than any world we could ever hope to purchase with earthly wealth. It is, in fact, a tragedy that Amy Cooper could have chosen to meet a brother in Christ that day chosen to do so, to meet Christian Cooper, the man that she tried to murder. And in him, I think that she would have met an amazing human being. From everything that I've read, Christian Cooper is an astoundingly brilliant person. But instead, Amy chose to call the slave patrol to discipline a child of God who she saw as less than human. That is what whiteness can be when it is allowed to simply fester in the fertilizer of American racism. And as several very wise people have pointed out, there is a deep and bitter irony in the fact that Amy and Christian share the same last name. For what this implies about the relationship between her ancestors and his ancestors. This system, this choice, this action of summoning state violence in order to punish someone who you believe is beneath you is not particularly complicated. It is a simple system that says, I am an American and you are not. I have rights and you do not. I am a person and you are not. And I am terrified terrified of a world where this is no longer the status quo. White people, when you call the police on a black person, I want you to understand that you are calling down the power of death on a human being made in the image of God. And when you dial 911 on a person of color, I want these two words to flash through your mind. Slave patrol. Slave patrol. Can we fix this deeply broken system? Or do we summon the winds of Pentecost rather than to teach, to instead burn it and everyone in that room right to the ground? And can people, can white people ever be made well 
Borrowing a phrase from Dr. King, is there any medicine sufficient to heal our sick white brothers? And I believe so. Or I wouldn't be here. I believe that many people walking into that room on that first Pentecost, they may have given up. They may have said, as so many before them said, these people will never be one in the Spirit. It's human nature. Instead, we need to double down on the enforcement of barricades and borders, and we need to keep some of them over there in their place. Those people will always exist. And there will be others who will say, nothing will ever change. But you know, I don't really believe that. Because I still have my own hopes. And they're hopes for my children as well. I believe in a Pentecost where being a human, a child of God, is the first and most beautiful common denominator. Because when we make this choice, suddenly the unique and stunning diversity, the array of differences between us become colors of a single garment of destiny. We cease colonizing and changing and forcing people into a single monoculture of Americanism or whiteness or whatever you want to call it. And instead, we see another human being with a life and a culture and a faith that is as precious and unique as a single wildflower in a field exploding with color. Everything that we are seeing this week from the lynching of Ahmad Arbery by violent white terrorists in Brunswick to the execution of an innocent man named George Floyd in Minneapolis by municipal slave patrols to the attempted murder of Christian Cooper by a white woman in New York City. All of this, all of this white violence and white rage against innocent black bodies is the inheritance of centuries of theft, looting, violence, and oppression the theft and looting of the property, labor, and intelligence of black people. Now, you may have been bothered earlier by my insistence that the people bound in slavery in the South were Americans. They were enslaved Americans from the second they set foot on American soil. In America, part of this experiment one of the things that we agreed ought to be so but have never properly accomplished is this idea that our rights come from God and not the government. The slave patrollers, the people today who hate immigrants, those who despise the 2.3 million Americans currently in prison, those are our modern-day chattel slaves, those people believe that our rights come from the government and not from God. They want you to show a government ID to vote, to walk freely down the street, or to sit peacefully in a park. And they want black people, especially, to understand that their rights don't come from God, but that their rights come from the pleasure of the United States government and the president and the people who pay the paychecks of the police. If you are an immigrant, they say, you have no rights because you don't have a special piece of paper from the government that has the word citizen written on it. A special piece of paper that they got on the day they were born. Well, Americans, these people are wrong. Your rights come from God. And every single person who has been enslaved in this country, either as the chattel of wealthy white landowners or as the wards of the currently privately owned prison systems or in custody by DHS or ICE, every single American who has been detained and searched without reason by the police, every single person who has been assaulted by the police or executed in the streets without a fair trial, these people have had their God-given rights violated. And I will leave it to you to analyze the appropriate response. Kindred, this is Pentecost. 
When I didn't ask you to listen to these words to hurt you or to make you feel bad about yourself, or most especially not to make you feel ashamed. Those things, those feelings of shame and, and, and hurt harden the heart. They lead to defensiveness. Okay? And defensiveness is poison. We know that, right? Rather, instead, I just want to give us an opportunity to choose again in the midst of this awfulness that we're experiencing to choose to be the people of Pentecost. A people who, when they see division, instead sow in love and generosity and mercy. A people who, when they see the powerful using violence and wealth to keep those people in their place, reject that message and loudly and publicly decry a crooked system, a racist system, and then teach others this true history, the true history of America. And most of all, if I could do anything for you, it would be to open your eyes to the absolutely breathtaking beauty of the individual story of every other human being you encounter. Not to make you colorblind. That's, colorblindness is just another white word for refusing to see a human being. But rather the opposite. To open your mind and your heart to the powerful stories, the victories, the tragedies, the, 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 the wonderful journeys of every other human being that you're going to meet on your very brief trip through this life. That, I think, would be the moment of Pentecost, and I think that that would be a lovely outcome for a human life, to have had that experience. You can choose, you know, and you can take sides. Jesus took sides. I do all the time, I'm, I'm, and I'm no less a patriot for criticizing my nation. In fact, oftentimes, the patriotic thing you can do, the most patriotic thing you can do, is criticize your beloved country. And I'm not kind of a radical for telling the truth about the sickness of racism in America. If you can't see it, you're simply being willfully blind to what's going on. I'm simply a man who wants to be in the room where the people are laughing and dancing and sharing and singing beautiful songs in languages that I don't speak, surrounded not by people who I think of as strangers or immigrants, but by human beings. That sounds very nice to me. A room where I'm not judged by how much money I make. A room where I can look into your eyes and you can look into mine, into the eyes of my children and I into the eyes of yours and see human miracles and children of God. I know that they're out there mocking us for believing in impossible things. But kinfolk, we're followers of Jesus Christ. We have it on his authority to believe in impossible things. Endlessly. For though we don't know how long it will take to get there, we can be most assured of the destination. And it will arrive. The victory is secure. Eyes forward, hand on the gospel plow. Amen. Please join me in a prayer for our church. Spirit of God, we long to be open to your presence in our church and in our lives. Fill us with your wind and your fire that we might be enlivened again. Help us hear the words as if for the first time that they might touch us again. Give us visions and dreams of what you long for in your creation, that we might begin to live them into reality. Come, Spirit, come into our very selves. And please join me as we pray as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Kindred, as we prepare our hearts to ponder anew what we can do with our gifts, I want to encourage you to please again visit uh, our website, fccgiving.org, and give sacrificially as you are able. Also, I want to remind you all uh, who are out there who are listening to this that our church has resources available for you. Privately, discreetly, you can reach out to me or anyone else, but if you're in trouble, please let somebody know. Don't suffer in silence. Our church's Deacons Fund exists to make small disasters disappear. That's what we try to do as a family of faith. So if you or a loved one or someone you know is struggling right now, go ahead and reach out to me and put me in touch with them and we will do as much as we can uh, in total confidence, privately and quietly. Uh, But if we can't be here for one another in times like this, then what are we here for? Friends, consider making a gift to the church this week um, to support her ministries that are very much alive and at work here in Kalamazoo. The offering is what we can give when we cannot be there in person. Kim folk, we have our work cut out for us this week, but we also know that we have been given every good gift in Christ that we need to do that which God is calling us to. Let's celebrate the victory that we know in our hearts will arrive. That's how we be an Easter people together. Brothers and sisters, go forth into your week filled with love and encouragement, knowing that you are deeply and unconditionally loved by God. Amen.